the tattered prince, captain of the windblown, cuts a striking figure in A Dance with Dragons. The roguish and twisty captain has a particular habit of ripping strips of clothing from the raiment of his fallen enemies. They're sewed into a multicolored cloak that billows behind him, a grim reminder to his enemies that they face the deadly and exiled Prince of Pentos. His tatters serve as his identity, and yet it tells us really nothing about the man. Before he ran from Pentos, tatters had a name, a house, a life. Tatters, as he's called by his wind-blown brethren, is framed by George as a mystery for the reader to see if they can puzzle him out. In the same book, Tyrion is deducing the true identity of Griff to actually be the exiled Lord John Connington in disguise. Perhaps Tatters is another long-lost Westerosi hiding behind a fake identity, another puzzle to solve. Challenge accepted, George. In this video, I will be taking the great and powerful turtle's bait and figuring out exactly who this tattered prince really is. Rip his mask off Scooby-Doo style like I did previously in my videos on the tattered prince's trusted employees, Pretty Maris and Kago Corpse Killer, and see who really hides beneath the tattered cloak. Alongside this video, I'll be giving away a 2021 A Song of Ice and Fire calendar by artist Sam Hogg, signed by George R.R. Martin himself, and a faceless coin to get you into the house of black and white. Stick around to the end of the video for instructions on how to enter. Before we jump into that, an important thing to bring up is the five year gap itself. I made a five minute video explaining this if you want a more detailed explanation, link in the description and in the corner of this video. When George abandoned the five year gap, he was already well into writing the arcs of his characters. He didn't want to let them go though, and some of those arcs and plots have been preserved elsewhere in Dance with Dragons and A Feast for Crows. In my Pretty Maris video, I argued that Pretty Maris of the Windblown was exactly one of these salvage ideas, an alternate future for Brienne of Tarth. And in The Tattered Prince, I believe the same thing is going on. George often plays with his characters like this, using side characters and his other stories to play out character arcs and plots that he didn't get around to using. Like for instance, very clear parallels between Victorian Greyjoy's firearm and Arya Targaryen's fireworms, Rhaenyra Targaryen and Cersei Lannister, Aegon the Unworthy and Robert Baratheon, Bran of Tarth and Podrick Payne to Duncan the Tall and Egg, among many, many others. He uses these as a way of exploring the road not taken for himself and also to aid the reader in understanding the choices he made. First, let's get a refresher on old Tatters. Before he was tattered and even a prince, Tatters was a nobleman living in the city of Pentos and a member of the 40 families that descended from Valyria living La Vida Loca. And then one fine day, the magisters of Pentos elected a young Tatters as their new prince. Great, right? Well, not so much. They had not finished cleaning up from beheading the previous prince hours earlier. The prince is a sacrificial lamb of the city of Pentos that the council of magisters kill when their fortunes turn sour. Being named prince meant Tatters knew that he would have a short life before being murdered to pay for the mistakes of the magisters. However, he refused to become that prince, grabbed his sword and a horse, and ran from power, becoming a sellsword in the disputed lands. Not that disputed lands. This establishes Tatters as someone who wishes to make their own choices, not live at the mercy of a council of magisters and a man of ambition. While he would have been wealthy and treated as royalty as Prince of Pentos while it lasted, he would have no self-determination in that life. Tatters served in many sellsword companies before forming his windblown with five compatriots. Of those six founders, mysteriously, only Tatters has managed to survive to the current day. With the windblown, he achieved wealth at his ambition and had autonomy in a world where so few do. He thrived despite the city of Pentos and his act of personal rebellion. Now, I've been calling him Tatters because we don't actually know his true name. Instead, his identity is tied up in his famous cloak. His tattered cloak is one he has made over the years sewed from scraps to rip off surcoats of his recently dead foes, and this cloak serves as the captain of the Windblown's identity card wherever he goes. His ragged cloak was made of twists of cloth of many colors, blue and gray and purple, red and gold and green, magenta and vermilion and cerulean, all faded by the sun. He comments to Quentin Martell on how people recognize his cloak rather than his actual features. My ragged raiment, the Pentashi gave a shrug, a poor thing, yet those tatters fill my foes with 
fear. And on the battlefield, the sight of my rags blowing in the wind emboldens my men more than any banner. If I want to move unseen, I need only slip it off to become plain and unremarkable. A trick we've seen done elsewhere in A Song of Ice and Fire, like Mance Raider, who removed his own scarlet and smoke cloak to become Abel the Bard and sneak into Winterfell. It's a common idea, there's no social media in Westeros, so unless you personally know someone's face, it can be easy to disappear with these kind of small tricks. Although the Tattered Prince does undersell his appearance as plain and unremarkable a bit. Tatters has features that might seem common in Essos and the Lyrian Daughters, but not in Westeros. Being of noble Pentashi birth of the 40 families, Tatters most likely had Valyrian features that age and battle have worn down over time. Over 60 years old, these days his defining features are his eyes and hair. In the yellow candlelight, his silver gray hair seemed almost golden, though the pouches underneath his eyes were etched as large as saddlebags. Golden, silvery hair is a very common feature among Valyrian descendants like the Pentashi, his eyes sad and showing marks of how little the prince sleeps. Tatter's way of handling himself in his posture though tell a very different story, as we see from Quentin Martell and Tyrion Lannister. They both describe him as having elegance, grace, power, and command, a leader of men that knows how to project authority. An old man he was, past 60, yet he still sat straight and tall in the high saddle, and his voice was strong enough to carry to every corner of the field. One was an elegant Pentashi, gray-haired and clad in silk but for his cloak, a ragged thing sewn from dozens of strips of torn, blood-stained cloth. When he's not leading in the field, however, the Tatter Prince is a bit of an asshole. He openly mocks those around him by giving them his cutting assessments. The Windblown is a company of many cruel nicknames, with Quentin Martell picking up the name Frog as a reference to his quickness at following orders, but also a joke at his wide, unhandsome face, a habit seemingly reinforced by their commander who greatly enjoys needling people with them. The tattered prince sipped at his wine. So, no wedding for Prince Frog. Is that why you've come hopping back to me? Have my three brave Dornish lads decided to honor their contracts? But a self-aware asshole, Tatters knows how people feel about him and seems to revel in that reputation, even using his bad reputation to his advantage when he commands the Westerosi members of his company to turn cloak as a ruse. The best ruses always have some seed of truth, said the tattered prince. Every one of you has ample reason for wanting to abandon me. More than just a self-aware asshole, some may even call him cruel. Tatters is especially cruel with deserters who broke their contracts to serve him. Quentin is well aware that his desertion from the Windblown will mean death, that the Windblown will hunt down deserters and deliver them exquisite pain. Tatters uses these threats of extreme violence as a tool for obedience. It's desertion whenever we do it, argued Garrus, and the tattered prince takes a dim view of deserters. He'll send hunters after us, and seven save us if they catch us. If we're lucky, they'll just chop off a foot to make sure we never run again. If we're unlucky, they'll give us the pretty Maris. The tattered prince gave a shrug. Every turn cloak has his tail. You're not the first to swear me your swords, take my coin, and run. All of them have reasons. Another fellow told me our food was so rich he had to flee before it made him sick. So I had his foot cut off, roasted up, and fed it to him. Then I made him our camp cook. Our meals improved markedly, and when his contract was fulfilled, he signed another. Tatters also has an incredible amount of selfishness. It's well known that sellsword commanders take the largest share of the contracts they make. Tatters also constantly breaks contracts as the wind blows for the most profit, creating bidding wars among his employers. When faced with competing contracts and vows, he tends to choose the one that will help him the most. They make you swear and swear after all. Tatters though seems to push the envelope in that regard. The plunder from Astapor was much less than you were promised in Volantis, and I took the lion's share of it. Adding this all up, we get a fascinating portrait of a character that should by now be sounding a bit familiar. Someone you know well. An elegant and well-trained soldier skilled in leading armies. An unabashed jerk with a sharp tongue, he uses his reputation and trappings of power to get what he wants, often using past examples of violence. A man with golden hair, he uses their soiled cloak as their identity. A man without scruples, who demands the lion's share, and runs from power at a young age, seeking a life on his own terms. That's right, the tattered prince is none other than Jamie Lannister, the Lion of Lannister, Prince of Casterly Rock, 
the soiled knight, the Kingslayer. But not the Jamie we know though. Not the one who went to Raventree Hall and negotiated peace with the Blackwoods and Brackens, ignored Cersei's letter pleading to return, threatened to catapult Edmure's child against a castle wall. No, this Jamie Lannister, much like Pretty Maris and Brienne, is an alternate future version of himself. An idea that George toyed with and discarded about how he could write his Kingslayer. Again, this has to do with the five-year gap and how George writes his novels. Recalling our earlier discussion about the five-year gap, we know George takes earlier plot and character ideas and refashions them as new ideas come into focus. But these unused character arcs and plots are not gone, they're still in his head. And sometimes those ideas are reincarnated on the page in characters like Pretty Maris, Kago Corpse Killer, and the Tattered Prince. George draws two fairly striking comparisons between Jamie and Tatters. The first is their physical appearance. No one can mistake the handsome, golden-haired line of Lannister for an aging man with bags under his eyes, right? Jamie is not a person that could ever be anonymous. Well, not so fast. In A Storm of Swords, when Jamie is returned by Brienne to King's Landing, the previously realm-renowned Lannister is unrecognizable. The realm knows Jaime Lannister is a beardless knight with long golden hair. A bald man with a filthy yellow beard may pass unnoticed. I'd sooner not be recognized while I'm in irons. Partly by choice, during his journey, he had his cousin Cleos shave his head and let his beard grow out. Anonymous and worn down by his journey, not even his brothers on the Kingsguard recognized the Kingslayer. Sir Marin Trant's droopy eyes went wide. Sir Jaime? How nice to be remembered. Move these men aside. When he heard the door open, he closed the white book and stood to receive his sworn brothers. Sir Osmond Kettleblack was the first to arrive. He gave Jamie a grin, as if they were old brothers in arms. Sir Jamie, he said, had you looked like this the other night, I'd have known you at once. Would you indeed? Jamie doubted that. The servants had bathed him, shaved him, and washed and brushed his hair. When he looked in a glass, he no longer saw the man who had crossed the riverlands with Brienne. But he did not see himself either. His face was thin and hollow, and he had lines under his eyes. I looked like some old man. This is almost exactly what we heard previously from Tatters on his method of disguise. Jamie at that moment looks more like the prince than ever before with thin features and lines under his eyes. And although Jamie has no multicolored cloak as his identity, he does have two highly recognizable ones. The white cloak of the King's Guard and his Lannister Golden Crimson. He only needs to shed those and cut his hair and suddenly the most infamous man in the Seven Kingdoms is another bystander. Much like Arya is taught by the Faceless Men, playing on expectations is half the battle of the skies. The lesson is one that Tatters and Jamie both understand and demonstrate perfectly to go from famous to anonymous with tools far less impressive than magical face masks. Their connections don't stop there. The two amazingly share the same type, color, and description of their horses. Tatters himself rides a huge gray warhorse, which also has a multicolored cloak. The stallion's spotted hindquarters were covered with ragged strips of cloth torn from the surcoats of men his master had slain. The same as Jamie's destrier during his time in the Riverlands. His palfrey was a blood bay, his destrier a magnificent gray stallion. It had been long years since Jamie had named any of his horses. He had seen too many die in battle, and that was harder when you named them. But when the Piper Boy started calling them Honor and Glory, he laughed and let the name stand. Glory wore the trappings of Lannister Crimson. Honor was barded in Kingsguard White. Same trick is easily done with his gray stallion as Tatter's gray warhorse. Remove the signature Kingsguard trappings in Lannister Crimson, and they could be any other horse on the battlefield or riding through the gates of Marine to the fighting pits unnoticed. Their personalities are also remarkably alike. For instance, their streaks of being insulting assholes. Tyrion is generally considered the Lannister with the sharpest tongue, but Jamie is no slouch. He spends most of the books dropping devastating one-liners and roasting those around him like he's the Mad King. I shall rule until my son comes of age. I don't know who I pity more, her brother said, Tommen or the Seven Kingdoms. I learned from Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning, could have slain all five of you with his left hand while he was taking a piss with the right. By the time I'm done, no man will ever know that a castle once stood here. Jamie got to his feet. Your wife may whelp before that. You'll want your child, I expect. I'll send him to you when he's born with a trebuchet. Jamie is cruel as well as Tatters, threatening to fire an infant with a trebuchet into a wall, shoving Bran Stark to try and kill him, dueling Ned Stark in the streets of King's Landing for Tyrion, killing Aerys and Rossart with his own blade rather than keeping them alive for justice. 
He also uses his reputation as the Kingslayer to push people around and make very believable threats. Although Jamie has always saved his best insults for Brienne of Tarth. During their journey back to King's Land together, Jamie made sure Brienne knew exactly how ridiculous, ugly, and idiotic he thought she was. When I quarrel, I do it with a sword, cuz. I was speaking to the lady. Tell me, witch, are all the women on Tarth as homely as you? I pity the men if so. Perhaps they do not know what real women look like living on a dreary mountain in the sea. Have no fear, wench. Your thighs are purple and green, and I'm not interested in what you've got between them. Over time, Jamie begins respecting Brienne more. It doesn't stop him from roasting her like they were at a comedy club. Tatters has a very similar relationship with his own right-hand woman, Pretty Maris. He often teases her in a very similar way, particularly about her lack of breasts, while talking to Quentin Martell. You brought three men, Sir Garrus pointed out, with an edge in his voice. We agreed on two apiece. Maris is no man. Maris, sweet. Undo your shirt. Show him. That would not be necessary, said Quentin. If the talk he'd heard was true, beneath that shirt, pretty Maris had only scars left by the men who'd cut her breast off. And Jamie doing much the same, mocking Brienne. Which, as I pointed out in my Brienne Pretty Maris video, is one of the major similarities between the two characters. Their relative unattractiveness and physical scars. Or would Sir Brienne be more your taste? He laughed. No, I fear not. You can trick out a milk cow and crupper, crinet, and chamfron and bard her all in silk. It doesn't mean you can ride her into battle. With Brienne, the insults gradually fall into respect and attraction growing between the pair. Jamie begins trusting her more than anyone else, arming her with the recently reforged Valyrian steel sword Oathkeeper to find Arya and Sansa Stark, an insanely generous gift worth more than all the gold in Casterly Rock. This is showing that Jamie grudgingly admits her skill and value to him as a person. That was unworthy, he mumbled. I'm a maimed man and bitter. Forgive me, wench. You protect me as well as any man could and better than most. She wrapped her nakedness in a towel. Do you mock me? Tatters also treats his Brienne as his most trusted and capable soldier. He goes so far as putting her in charge of not only Quentin's plot to steal the dragons with Kago, but also to deliver the secret messages and negotiate with Daenerys Stormborn about the windblown switching sides. Maris will command you, said the tattered prince. She knows my mind in this, and Daenerys Targaryen may be more accepting of another woman. As you say, Sir Barristan lowered his voice. Your grace, we set the woman Maris free as you commanded. Before she went, she asked to speak with you. I met with her instead. She claims this tattered prince meant to bring the windblown over to your cause from the beginning, that he sent her here to treat with you secretly, but the Dornishmen unmasked them and betrayed them before she could make her own approach. If Jamie Lannister were in charge of a sellsword company, this deep level of trust and confidence he has in Brienne would lead to a relationship that feels nearly identical to that of Tatters and Maris. I believe this is a key element in how they are so similar. Brienne is an important valued part of Jamie's life, the same as Maris to Tatters. Jamie is also a prince of sorts. And no, I don't mean the tin foil that he's Aerys' son. Ugh. Rather, Jamie shares this backstory of a young lordling of an ancient powerful family who refused power to follow a life of adventure. Tyrion says this of his older brother only three chapters before we meet the tattered prince and get his backstory. My brother Jamie thirsts for battle, not for power. He's run from every chance he's had to rule. Jamie stood to inherit the whole of the Westerlands, becoming one of the most powerful lords in Westeros. With it would come a life of politics, court power, and a dangerous game of dancing with the dragons of House Targaryen. That is a life that Jamie never wanted. When Jamie was a squire for Arthur Dane, he got his first taste of battle and adventure when they hunted down the legendary Kingswood Brotherhood. They fought the outlaws parlayed with the locals and lived a true adventure. From there, Jamie refused his birthright and through machinations of Cersei and Varys, was named to the King's Guard at only 15 years old. Partly for his desire to be near Cersei for some sweet, sweet twin cess, but he also had a taste of the soldier's life. He didn't want casually rock, he wanted adventure. A chance to run enemies through with his sword and learn from the best like Barristan the Bold, Arthur Dane, Sword of the Mort, Gerald the White Bull Hightower, Prince Lewin Martell. Almost as if to prove Tyrion's earlier point, George has Jamie demonstrate this. 
We are his heirs, Jamie, she whispered. It will be up to us to finish his work. You must take father's place as hand. You, will s you see that now, surely. Tommen will need you. He pushed away from her and raised his arm, forcing his stump to her face. A hand without a hand, a bad jape, sister. Don't ask me to rule. In a feast for crows, Jamie pulls a tattered prince and disappears into the Riverlands trying to bring peace, but also questioning his loyalty to his new king and son Tommen, as well as his lover Cersei. George is very carefully laying out in the scenario in his post five year gap books that Jamie is once again running from power. So that's kind of the hints. That's how Jamie and Tatters are similar, but, but what about where they split? In the original 1993 outline, Gurm initially had a very different idea for the life and times of one Jamie Lannister. Rather than the internal struggle of Jamie deciding between his vows and personal desires, the King's Slayer didn't stop at slaying one king. Instead, Jamie would have killed his way to becoming the King of Westeros. Tyrion Lannister will continue to travel, to plot, and to play the Game of Thrones, finally removing his nephew Joffrey in disgust at the Boy King's brutality. Jamie will follow Joffrey onto the throne of the Seven Kingdoms by the simple expedient of killing everyone ahead of him in the line of succession and then blaming his brother Tyrion for the murders. You can still see parts of it in Game of Thrones where George was setting up the villainous rogue Jamie to be fit for the crown of Westeros. Most notably, an infamous line of foreshadowing from Jon Snow when he sees Jamie riding into to Winterfell in the opening chapters. Sir Jaime was twin to Queen Cersei, tall and golden, with flashing green eyes and a smile that cut like a knife. He wore crimson silk, high black boots, a black satin cloak. On the breast of his tunic, the line of his house was embroidered in gold thread, roaring its defiance. They called him the Lion of Lannister to his face and whispered Kingslayer behind his back. Jon found it hard to look away from him. This is what a king should look like, he thought to himself as the man passed. The intention being that the drastic appearances between King Robert and Jaime, planting the seed in the mind of the reader that the Kingslayer would one day set the Iron Throne, a seed he never developed until the Tattered Prince took shape in his mind. Tatter's elegance, command of battle, leadership, royalty, all fit in when you look back at the original Jamie, a more selfish, out for himself version, the man Jamie was always meant to be. This is where we get the outline of the twist for how Jamie becomes the Tattered Prince. Starting in A Storm of Swords, not only is Jamie running from power, he begins judging his actions in a curious way. He recalls vividly the defining moments of his young life when he, as a squire, joined Sir Arthur Dane in a detachment of soldiers to hunt down the infamous. Kingswood Brotherhood. And he'd held his own against the Smiling Knight, though it was Sir Arthur who slew him. What a fight it was, and what a foe. A Smiling Knight was a madman. Cruelty and chivalry all jumbled up together, but he did not know the meaning of fear. And Dane, with dawn in hand, the outlaw's longsword had so many notches by the end that Sir Arthur had stopped to let him fetch a new one. It's that white sword of yours I want. The robber knight told him as they resumed, though he was bleeding from a dozen wounds by then. Then you shall have it, sir, the sword of the morning replied and made an end of it. After a storm of swords, Jamie is going through a personal transformation of character and self-reflection that he really has never done before. This transformation begins by losing his hand, but also through the influence of Brienne, whose idealism and commitment to justice have a profound effect on Jamie. He also begins defining his actions in a binary way, the smiling knight or Arthur Dane, functioning like the angel and devil on his shoulders. The world was simpler in those days, Jamie thought and men as well as swords were made of finer steel. Or was it that he had only been 15? They were all in their graves now, the Sword of the Morning and the Smiling Knight, the White Bull and Prince Lewin. Sir Oswell went with his black humor, Ernest John Derry, Simon Toyne and his Kingswood Brotherhood, bluff old Sumner Craighall, and me, that boy I was. When did he die, I wonder? When I donned the white cloak, when I opened Ares's throat, that boy wanted to be Sir Arthur Dane, but someplace along the way he'd become the Smiling Knight instead. In the course of Feast and Dance, Jamie chooses to stay true to Arthur Dane 
even as he scoffs at Cersei's pleas for help. He sorts out the Blackwoods and Brackens without a battle, ends the siege of Riverrun with some gruesome threats, that again resolves a possible battle without any blood spilled. But what if he didn't? Instead of charging Brienne with finding the Stark girls at the end of a storm of swords and giving her Oathkeeper, what if Jamie went with her instead, right off on another quest as a soldier in the field again, tearing off his Kingsguard whites and Lannister crimson and gold, fashioning them into a patchwork cloak, finally free from his courtly duties, free to fight the battles he wants, and never be commanded by anyone again. His own company, his own life, a smiling knight. Where would that take Jamie and Brienne after five years though? They'd have no money between them, no Stark girls to protect. Perhaps embracing his smiling knight side, Jamie could find companions over time to ride with. Cast offs from wars, veterans of the Brotherhood Without Banners, those who recognize Jamie's impressive skills in command with Brienne's deadliness with the blade, a new Kingswood Brotherhood forming around the core of trust between Jamie and Brienne, the soiled knight and Brienne the beauty replacing his missing right hand. This makes the rest of the Windblown possibly doppelgangers of characters we meet in the Brotherhood Without Banners and other other minor characters throughout Jamie and Brienne's journey th through the Riverlands. This is really the only forward path the Brotherhood Without Banners has as a sustainable organization. In A Dance with Dragons and A Feast for Crows, the Brotherhood has fallen on hard times. They lack for food and supplies, pushing away potential allies in the Riverlands with Lady Stoneheart's extreme violence. Once a moral, purposeful organization led by Beric, Stoneheart's new Brotherhood is described by Thoros of Mir as just ordinary outlaws, and they have very few options left. Be defeated by the throne, like the Kingswood Brotherhood of years past, dissolve, or become mercenaries for hire. After living lean so long in the woods, the veritable oceans of gold sellswords earn would seem like a dream come true. After all, you'll ride to battle with the tattered prince and come home richer than a lord, as the saying goes. And that is the trick of the wind blown, the tattered prince, pretty Maris, Kago, and the rest. They are this alternate universe, five year gap version of George's Riverlands plot, except instead of placing them in the Riverlands where they would obviously be in conflict with Stoneheart's group, they are hidden within Essos by our author. Across time and space, the alternate future of Jamie's Kingswood Brotherhood has been blown by the West Wind Zephyrus marooned in a strange land, disguised by our author so the audience doesn't exactly realize who they are. The Tattered Prince, the Smiling Knight, the Prince who ran from power. They're the same person at their core, different versions of Jamie Lannister playing out different plot lines. One who chose to be Arthur Dane and one who chose to be the Smiling Knight. Looking at the Tattered Prince this way not only gives the author fascinating view to George's rising process with the Kingswood Brotherhood 2.0, but also who Jamie may end up becoming in the final books. The show gave us a version of this when Jamie left for Winterfell, doing exactly as I proposed, leaving behind his Kingsguard vows, the gold and crimson of House Lannister, the expectations of Tywin, his love of Cersei, his brother's jokes, and trying to just be Jamie, an exiled prince with a tattered cloak riding away with just his sword and horse, making his own destiny for once.